So good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's Knowledge Bytes for Business webinar, What is Circularity? This is part of RGU's week-long Sustainability in Creative and Cultural Industries Symposium and another webinar in RGU's Runway to COP26. My name is Neil Farman, the Net Zero Business Development Manager here, and I will be hosting the session. RGU's Sustainability in Creative and Cultural Industries Symposium has covered a number of diverse topics, such as entrepreneurship, sustainable fashion and tourism. This afternoon, we will be focusing on the much discussed area of circularity, and more specifically the question, what is circularity? So just before we get started today, a couple of quick points. Today's session is being recorded and we'll be finishing up with a short Q&A session. So please do pop questions or feedback into the chat box and we can get to these at the end of today's talk. Presenting today will be RGU Grade School of Art experts, Josie Steed and Daniel Sutherland. So Josie and Daniel have been busy conducting interviews with some industry experts to find out their insights into the topic of circularity. We will hear from Terry Vogt, who is project manager for Circular Northeast. Terry has worked in various environmental capacities as consultant and in the public and private sectors and firmly believes that manufacturing is central to supporting the move to net zero and a circular economy. Terry is currently leading a programme called Circular Northeast based at Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce and funded by, net, by Zero Waste Scotland. The role of the programme is to raise awareness of the circular economy in the region and to support local businesses develop more circular approaches. We will also be hearing from Mo Tomine. Mo is director at Wise Birds Network, a consultancy for small design-led enterprises, focusing on fashion, textiles, lifestyle and jewellery. Mo is also a designer and advises on sustainable value chains in fashion and textiles. Mo has been a researcher, educator, mentor and acted as an advisor to policy and campaign or, or campaigning organisations, so has a diverse experience in the industry. Lynn Wilson is a circular economy business consultant. Lynn has worked on the development of products and services in diverse locations with indigenous tribes in Botswana to complex policy led systems, including town planning and the circular economy in Scotland as sector manager at Zero Waste Scotland. Lynn is currently completing her PhD thesis at University of Glasgow entitled Closing the Loop, Driving a Post-Consumer Clothing Circular Economy. Ben Durack, is Director of Origin Plastics Limited, a course leader for the BA Honours Three-Dimensional Design at Gray School of Art, RGU. Origin Plastics is an RGU startup company that aims to redefine waste plastic by developing an approach to circularity that allows the recycling of waste materials to design new products at the source of waste to reduce our carbon footprint. And finally, Beth Wilson, Beth graduated from the Heriot Watt University, Scotland College of Textiles, specialising in woven textiles. After graduation, Beth worked as a designer with Johnson's of Elgin. She has recently started as a Knowledge Transfer Partnership Associate in partnership with RGU and Harris Tweed Hebrides. The project aims to provide year round and sustainable business demand for the Harris Tweed Hebrides brand and the home weaver industry on the Isle of Lewis and Harris. So these interviews were conducted with a series of questions that we will run through today. But first, I want to get insight from our experts, Daniel and Josie. So Josie, maybe if I come to you yourself first for the first question, what does circularity mean to you? Thanks, Neil. I mean, my, my background is in, in fashion and textile. So I, I, I would be looking at circularity, I suppose, specifically through the lens of fast fashion um, and and the kind of textile um, the, the textile supply chain um, what we have in in the the fashion and textile industry is a crisis um, where we have um, issues of um, con consumer consumer demand driving um, fashion uh, as an insustainable and an un unenvironmentally um, sustainable way. So circularity really is a priority for this industry where we have to think now about what circularity, and by that I mean, I suppose, trying to close the loop 
of materials and so that we're really thinking about um, how products as they come into the loop are continually um, maintained or rethought within the system. Ideally, looking towards no longer bringing in new unrefined materials um, into that system, but but re re um, re kind of thinking those so that they become um, really from the cradle to the cradle in the sense that they 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 take on new new lives. They can be assembled and disassembled um, and 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 create that closed loop. Thanks so much, Rosie, and, and that's a really interesting point. Daniel, if I maybe come to yourself, maybe if a little bit of background of your experience and your maybe working relationship uh, with, with circularity and then what circularity means to you. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, I'm, my, my background is product design and industrial-based design. And, you know, as a result of that, circularity to me is, is very much about materials. Um, and it's about that kind of the need to design out planned obsolescence you know to, to not have that as a core principle in the design process and, and to make sure just as Josie was talking about to make sure that products and their life cycle can be extended you know so that we design for that uh, right from the outset but my, what circularity really means to me is is about keeping materials and objects in use for longer and it's about hopefully decentralizing some of the consumption models that we have you know we we ship materials large distances to, to be used in manufacturing processes. And then we ship products large distances um, to consumers all the time, creating high kind of carbon impacts. Um, and by decentralizing um, and having micro circular economies, if possible, and living more local, um, people can, can quite easily try to impact on circularity uh, around them. So, yeah, cir circularity really for me is all about materials and it's about questioning our consumption models really and just trying to keep uh, objects and materials in use uh, for as long as possible. Thanks so much for that, Daniel and Josie. And I think a couple of interesting points there, you know, the decentralization of it and the term closing the loop, which I, I really liked the, the use of that term. And obviously that is um, part of Lynn's PhD thesis. So it's quite an interesting way to start. So maybe we can lead into the, to the, uh, the interview answers now. So what we'll hear from for this, for this theme is Lynn Wilson, Ben Durack and Mo Tomini. Thanks so much, Josie. And, and it's great to be invited to check out to you on this webinar series. And um, so for me, uh, I've been working in this space for about nine years. And in that time, I can see that there are three types of circularity. And those three types are, well, the first one, and I think the most important is holistic circularity, which is a soft circularity. And it's the role that the consumer plays in keeping goods in circulation for as long as possible, you know, buying less, making the best consumer choices, proper maintenance routines, and repurposing commodity parts where possible. And being able to access take back schemes is critical to that, to ensure the consumer uh, can uh, the take back schemes fit um, the consumer uh, need. And, and this is where the next uh, circularity comes in, and that's industrial circularity. And industrial circularity um, are the industries involved in industrial take back schemes, and such as electronic fiber processing to reuse parts and for example in the case of textiles processing natural fibers and secondary products and new technologies that process the polymer based fibers into uh, using closed loop technology and back into the same product whether it's part case for a, a, a piece of electronic equipment or, or a, a garment or a plastic board. but uh, and the third one is commercial circularity or business to business circularity. And, and that's where um, uh, you could see business to consumer models of any size that operate business models such as leasing, rental, and product libraries. 
to offer the consumer an alternative product solution to just owning a product. So there we see the sort of integration of uh, consumer, circular VI, circular specialists. And um, that's something that I'm really passionate about getting across, is that every individual is has the potential to be a circular economy ambassador. And in actuality, is practicing circularity every day. And it's something hugely overlooked uh, by the industry, which has been very policy-led, very um, industry-led, design-led, thought leadership-led. But without really looking at, wait a wee minute, who's at the centre of this? And then, who is at the centre of this? Oh, as Professor Walter Schell says, you, me, we are at the centre of the circular economy. But we can't do that without industry to really support us um, to keep circulation going. We can't do that without micro, small, big businesses who are really willing to get on board with these new business models. As a product designer, it's just the understanding that um, objects, products at the moment and traditionally have always been designed for, for one use. Um, so it's, it's very much a linear economy where at the end of that use, it's, it's not thought about. Um, the design process finishes with production and supply to the customer. And um, there is no thought process as to what happens to that after, after it's used. Um, and I guess um, a couple of hundred years ago, that was probably fine as we got into the industrial revolution. But um, with, with the efficiency gains with manufacturing, um, and the development of materials, in particular plastics, um, we've reached a point now where it's almost like the height of consumerism, where we, we have the ability to produce something for almost nothing. Um, and I guess with, with an economy that's financially driven, there's, there's never been a need to think about the environment or the effect that we're having on the environment. Um, so I think for me personally, circularity is, is really sort of thinking about an approach that's holistic, that thinks of our material not as sort of in, in a linear way. It's, it's thinking of material as a precious resource we need to look after. Um, and actually by having more of a circular approach, then it, it is more holistic in the sense that we, we, by definition, take care of our environment because we're not necessarily extracting all of the resources from our environment. Um, I think just sort of having worked in industry and seen the impact that my work had alone um, and then just, I guess, scaling that up and seeing the impact that we're having on our environment um, and all the scary reports that are coming out, I think circularity is the answer to, <laughs> I guess, re addressing the issues that we've got. Um, and obviously, from, from origin standpoint, circularity is really about transparency. Um, so, like, as 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 a founder of Origin, we know that circular economies exist, but circular economies for plastic um, exist on such a massive scale that yeah. it's very very opaque. It's impossible to see into that. So, to the point where even even if someone that has been yes researching plastic circular economies for the last I don't know two three years now, I still don't know what happens when I throw a plastic water bottle in the bin. Um, I've no idea what happens to that. I know that only 9% of plastic has been recycled today. Um, we've produced over 9 billion tons of waste plastic, which is enough to, if you were to lay out all of the waste plastic we've ever created across the whole of the UK, um, including all the islands, we'd literally be standing up to our knees in that. So um, to not know what's happening to that is quite scary. So for, for Origin, it's about providing transparency to that. So it's circularity that you can see. So it's, it's empowering local communities to actually take that, that resource, not the waste, um, that resource, uh, rethink it and use it in a way where you can actually see what's happening at every step of the process. Um, so for us at Origin, it's, it's really important that I guess consumers see what's happening because for us, it's as much about recycling plastic as it is about behavior change. So circularity in, in if I'm wearing my consultant's hat, 
it might mean different things but in, in, as a consultant I suppose my job is to support people to find the market so I mean often when a, when a client is, has a very high tech solution sometimes they're not from the fashion industry but they've come up with some really wonderful kind of technical thing um, to work to target the fashion industry but often they don't really understand the way the fashion sector works so I think you know, when something is circular, a circular process, if it's heavily processed, which some circular things are, um, sometimes it can miss that kind of qualitative, I shouldn't say qua, that we need in fashion. So that's something I can help people with and also help them to understand where the market is and look at other aspects of the value chain. So if they're making a textile, they might not have understood about the sort of process of up, upstream um, processing sorry downstream processing uh, for example and then if, if you know I have also worked with clients who are doing um, so for example taking products and remaking them and I think that's also it's really important it comes back to being holistic well the two things I would say holistic and longevity those are the two key words for me really because is it you know if you're going to upcycle something still got to have that quality that makes somebody want to love it wear it keep it hopefully not throw it away again not tear it apart again and i think often it, it can miss that so i think it's important that that is part of the story so for me as a designer in terms of what i mean I, i'm starting it's a bit inside out i suppose i'm starting from the other side so i'm actually creating a collection that is taking all of my understanding of circularity sustainability environmental waste etc and social sustainability and i'm building that into my collection so it really comes i mean i want to make things that people will never want to throw away and it, you know so it, as a fashion designer and as a fashion consumer actually my whole life as a young even as a fashion student really i mean i was always remaking when i was a um, one of my first jobs as a designer was working in India and that was in the 80s so it's quite a long time ago before people really talked about sustainability and I was I found a sort of um, place where I could buy old saris and I started making them up because so I, I was based in India and I was working for a company but I used to, in my own time I found something to make up t-shirts out of old saris made to sell them on Camden Market when I came back so that you know that would be called upcycling now but it didn't it wasn't really called that then but i still got some of those and I, I every now and then somebody comes up to me and says oh, i'm still wearing this and sometimes they fell apart because they were so old but i mean some of them have fallen apart so there are still some of those still going around and i occasionally get to people some photographs of them and that's you know 40, nearly 40 years ago so it's quite a long time so that's the sort of you know that's what i'm striving for really is making things that are going to last and are going to be there forever. And then if there is an environmental impact, obviously one wants that to be as small as it can be, but it's divided over the however many years that products, I mean, I've got a wardrobe full of stuff that's 40 years old and I practically never buy anything new, but if I do, it works within everything else. So and that's, and I think that's, that's my aim in sustainable fashion. There's a couple of really interesting points there you know it is the reason that we're having this this webinar is what is does circularity actually mean holistically but it was quite interesting that to different people it, there's a lot of different sort of important aspects of it well there's also some similarities that align you know looking at things like transparency and waste avoidance and um, a couple of those topics i want to pick on uh maybe in a bit more detail of the q a session what we're focusing on now is what are the challenges with being more circular in your business or industry. Before we get on to the interviews, Josie, I know you've worked with industry quite, quite a bit. I just wanted to get your insights into this question before we move on. Yes, I, I, there are, I think, without doubt, a number of, of, of challenges for businesses. I think it, a lot of it is the fact that they are one, one component in, in a chain. And so businesses and industry are very reliant on working with their suppliers and having 
similar values and and um, objectives within within um, developing their um, their circular ethos and and so it, it is very hard for companies to do that as individuals because um, it is very much a collective effort that is needed and as we've heard um, I think with Lynn about um, sort of business to business that, that can be very tricky and, and I know Mo has also touched on that where um, being able to um, have I suppose to trust and to know exactly where your materials are coming from and and to know their origins um, and to be confident about those is 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 very difficult i think we're also finding within businesses um, that those that want to ensure that any waste materials um, are recycled or or have a, a further a further um a further um, life story, it's not always easy for them to find um, the, the, the correct information about the recycling. And, and, and with materials and, and fibres in particular, the kind of breakdown of, of materials is very complicated. Um, so we're seeing, I think, particularly in the textile industry, um, situations which are kind of critical that are being driven by policy where um, we will see big changes to policy and government policies about um, textiles into in, in landfill but also is not very clear I think for businesses about how they can um, respond to these, these 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 huge challenges and so we need um, a lot more joined up support um, with industry, I think, and industries and supply chains to, to really come together collectively to, to try and um, work on a lot of very complex chains. And, and, um, and, and that, that, require, that does really require co collaboration. And I think that's the answer is collaboration and cooperation. Thanks for that, Josie, and I think so. the key term there, collaboration and cooperation as well, really going to be sort of that theme going to be coming through quite strongly in this webinar. So what I want to do now is move on to the to the interview answers. Um, so we'll be hearing in this section from Beth Wilson, the KTP associate, Lynn Wilson, again, Ben Durak and Terry Boat. Specifically textile manufacturing, because there's so many processes and so much machinery, I think change anything would be a huge investment um, I believe um, that you know having discussions with other companies that further on in the chain um, production of garments and things really if they've got their standard machinery you're sewing machine and you're developing things that aren't going to change and they're, they're going to stay the same and it's, it's more of a consumable effort to make sure they've got less waste or um, buying sustainable fabrics or things like that but from a textile manufacturing point of view there's you know not all technologies ready to use yet so the technology that people might like us to invest in to make it more sustainable might actually either a not be ready or b yes still be a large investment yeah, but i think there's a few examples in italy and um, there's quite a lot there's a company that kind of breaks down old textiles um, and kind of cleans it up and then creates new yarn from recycled um, textiles. Um, but that's something that exists, but not um, it's not widely available yet. I mean, it probably is available, but it's so niche. It's not something that you could easily invest in aid for space. Um, the processing, it's quite niche still. Um, and other things like um, natural dyes, another company in say is uh, also quite far ahead in natural dyes. But at the moment, consistency for other mills to be able to consistently turn out the same colour of brown, which is still a massively high standard that we can meet for customers, is that particular shade of brown or you know whichever shade. Um, we're not quite maybe there yet, even though in theory it's an excellent idea. So one of the things is for established businesses, 
it's difficult to go from a linear supply chain to a circular one because it relies on cooperation from suppliers along the line and developing new relationships, new suppliers that uh, offer things like industry take-back schemes. And, and really, you need to be looking at how do you set that up? And, and you need to be realistic about what's your capacity as a business and what are you driven by? And what's your business ethos and model? And being really honest, does the circular economy suit you? Does a circular model suit you? Or is it actually uh, about sustainability and environmental sustainability? Is it, are, are these things, these things should be interconnected, but sometimes uh, when you're taking a business, you know, day one, thinking about the circular economy, what I've found is actually what we're dealing with is thinking about sustainability for the first time, because some businesses haven't thought about that. And there's a multitude of reasons that they haven't thought about that. And it's not, for me, it's not about a blame game. And day one is always the acknowledgement, okay, sustainability in our business, we, we really don't know. Can you help us? What can we do? What is the first step? And then from there, it's about building that long term or, or not too long term, you know, stages of terms of um, development towards the circular model and not beating yourself up, making sure that every part works for you and that you're genuine in your journey. And that if you fall down or if something doesn't work, that you've got something in place to support you with it, that you've got a good infrastructure of support. And what we do have in Scotland is, because we're, Scotland was such an early adopter of the circular economy, we're just full of experts. I mean, sometimes I can't get a word in, and, uh, but great to have one today. Uh, but so, you know, if you are thinking about this as a business, there's a whole load, a load of opportunity out there. But it's sometimes easier when a business is starting from scratch. And that said, if a business wants to consider circularity, then it's about building a business strategy that is manageable and suits the business model, as I said. So, for example, considerations like premises and looking at the pros and cons of whether a site or an office is actually necessary. You know, sometimes when a new business is starting out, you want that office, you want that desk space. And, of course, we've been encouraged because we've been in lockdown because we want to get the economy moving. There will be opportunities coming along to get people out there. You have to ask yourself, is that really is that really what I need? And then for equipment, does the business need assets? Or is it easier to rent uh, products and have leasing agreements in place? So it's also about being smart about the business model and demonstrating that. That becomes part of your business, uh, not just your business strategy, but your business story. Demonstrating how you are managing circularity in your business so that everything's completely integrated and um, and transparent. And if this, if it is thought in this way from the beginning, then it should save the business money as well as making money. Because so for example, businesses uh, more and more particularly, doesn't really matter what size the tender, they're being asked to demonstrate it's a, it's a prerequisite now, what is the sustainability strategy? You know, so if you want to win work um, and you want to win good work, then you have to really demonstrate more and more where you are with it. And so if you're able to say we're on this journey or I'm working towards a circular uh, system, but I'm not there yet, but I'm looking to build a customer base with this in mind, then that starts to build this business community so that we don't divorce this idea of sustainability and economy. You know, it has to be about the economy. We all know that. We all need stuff. We do need stuff. We just need the right stuff. I remember during my education at university, like I was I was always interested in circular economies. I was always I was always interested in the bit of design that. I guess that happens at the end of 
of that development where, whereby we are thinking about what happens to materials at the end of their lives. Um, and it, it was covered in university, but I guess it was sort of rose tinted classes. Um, and then you go out into industry. Um, and as much as you as you might sort of take that on as, as an additional element of a brief, um, a, a client might not expect that in there, but like me personally, I, I, I always try to push for that. Whether it was rethinking materials, whether it was rethinking obsolescence, whether it was rethinking, I guess, use cases. Um, but I, it was like a part of the reason why we started Origin is that for, for me, at least, I, for as much as I might push that, um, ultimately, I, I wasn't the decision maker. The client is the decision maker. So for as much as you as a product designer might might want to design for circularity um, and less of a sort of linear approach, or you might want to design out and obsolescence. Um, but ultimately, the decisions made by the client. Um, and so the only real way for us to have impact uh, or the impact we wanted to have was actually by doing it ourselves, I guess. One of the touches on what, what someone else uh, mentioned, I think, Daniel, you touched on, is that, that the best day to start is today. Um, there's no point in waiting for someone else to do it. If, 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 if you think there's something out there that you can address, then why, why not start today? Why, why shouldn't it be you? But the thing is that it really needs to be a, a societal move. And although each business and individual can play a certain role, we're, we're constrained by the sort of wider supply chains, Etc. So we really need to. I think the biggest challenge is, is that this is a this is a rethink in how we actually how we do things and how we value things within the economy. And so businesses and individuals can go can go so far, but we're never going to achieve a kind of full circular economy without every single player, I suppose, in, in society playing their part. Really. So I thought it was really interesting there that we've got quite a wide um, diverse set of answers again there. You know, Terry and Bed did give some s similar points there about, you know, whatever point you are in the supply chain, you're only really one actor within it. And um, Ben touched upon the client, Terry touched upon the supply chain, really sort of enabling how circular circularity really actually it works. Beth made interesting points there about the technology in the circular economy, whether that's the technology readiness level of it, the availability and the investment needed, maybe doesn't fit in with a sustainable business model at, at this time in some areas. Um, and I thought Lynn's point there about, you know, really business strategy, is it circularity from a start or is it sustainability leading to, leading to circular business models thereafter? You know, is really the question businesses should be posing from themselves. So really interesting topics there. Um, the next the next question was, why is it important for your business or sector to engage with this subject? Now, Daniel, I'm going to come to you uh, at this point. Obviously, I know that yourself been working alongside Ben on the, on the Origin Plastics organization startup. I want, want to get your thoughts on this before we move on to the answers. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of what we'll hear is, that, is actually, you know, people talking a lot about the fact that environment and sorry, environmental impact, it just can't be ignored. You know, consumers are looking for action in this space and they're actively questioning um, all companies, all providers, all service providers, etc. You know, they're, they're looking for the credentials in this space. Um, and I think the businesses can really benefit from um, not just engaging in this, in this subject area because it has a positive environmental impact, but also, it brings them closer to their consumers, uh, you know, and businesses these days, you know, marketing is about telling the story and it's about connecting with consumers and, and engaging with them um, on a different level, on a higher level. Uh, and I think that the circular economy and, and how you engage with that as a business allows you, allows you to do that. Um, so I think, I think in, from that perspective, it is really important for businesses and sectors to engage with the subject. And it's it's about thinking about your customer, but it's also about considering your place in, in supply chain. And we've heard a lot about that from everybody who Josie and I have spoken to. A lot of people cite the fact that, that they sit within supply chain management. And it's not only about indicating to your consumers how you feel about circularity, but it's also about indicating that to those that you, pro you provide services to within the supply chain or those that you procure services from. In a supply chain. So I, I think there's lots 
uh, of real benefit um, in here. And we, we hear some of that in, in the videos we're about to, about to watch. Thanks for that, Daniel. I thought it was a really insightful answer there. So what we'll do now is we'll move on to the answer of some, some of the Q&As that uh, you both undertook. So we'll hear from Terry Vogt, Beth Wilson and Lynn Wilson in this section. I think businesses are finding it harder and harder to be cynical about the sustainability agenda now. Um, and I think the fact that, you know, national governments setting targets and ambitions, the fact that, you know, we've still got some, some way to go, um, but you know, these things are starting to go down, supply chains, um, particularly around net zero, maybe slightly less circular economy, it's kind of, it's a, it's a bit behind that agenda or the understanding of relationship between the two. Um, but, but no, I, I think it is, it's definitely increasing. And I, in some ways, see, I've not seen a lot of cynicism when I've been doing events, I think a lot of it's because I think people see the wastefulness all around them. I think there's you know, there's no, it's very, you don't always see the impact of climate change. You don't, it's, it's sometimes difficult to sort of relate it to your everyday lives. I think we can all relate to our everyday lives, you know, regularly, the amount of wastefulness every time we put plastic in the bin, every time something, you know, the kettle breaks, we've only had it for a year, but we don't know how to repair it. You know, we have to buy another one and throw it away. You know, and that's frustrating. It's frustrating for us as individuals and businesses. Um, and I think, therefore, there's a, there's a realness about the circular economy to people in their everyday lives that makes them relate to it and makes them want to do something about it, even though, it's, even though that's not necessarily straightforward. I think we're all a bit frustrated that we can't you know, live less resource intensive and less wasteful lives. The statistic now is, I think, around about 4% of pollution is down to the fashion and textile industry. So moving forward, we are one of the biggest polluters. Um, and although there are some great benefits, like employing a mass amount of people around the world and giving all these people jobs, um, we do need to take responsibility for our parts in, you know, moving forward for the future. So... Definitely, there are things that we can move towards. There's um, the United Nations have set out their global standards for what they're working towards. And um, so some of them um, are focused particularly for kind of third world countries. Maybe we're quite lucky and we have things like um, uh, national, it's not minimum wage, what's it called? Uh, living, the living wage, sorry. We've got, we've got things like the living wage um, in place in the UK, which is great. Um, so some of them kind of cover that, and other ones are kind of wastewater, which is something that we need to work on, um, and you know, polluters and things like consumption of energy. Um, so that's a really good standard, um, one that we're looking, focusing on at High Street Hebrides. And the other two that we're looking closely at is the UKFT, have, um, you know, UK Fashion and Textiles. They've set their own kind of guidelines as well. Um, for slightly more achievable and um, specific textile industry um, guidelines, um, some of them to achieve by 2030 and some as far as 2050, um, to try and get our company to kind of a standard of which is expected of us moving forward. Um, and the third one is we're also a member of Walpole, um, so a luxury uh, group in the UK. Um, and there's again, because they support variety of luxury brands they're not as specific but they're, they're another good benchmark which we hope to be able to kind of meet moving forward um, and align our, and align our sustainable development goals as a company um, in with. Well there's no doubt that the future needs to be circular I mean in the race to carbon net zero by 2045 governments will bring in new legislation and such as, well, we know at the moment, extended producer responsibility is imminent. And that means that um, even although we are no longer part of the EU, we're still trading with the EU, we're still under European Union regulations, particularly with circular economy. And so things like extended producer responsibility will um, be mandatory for businesses who want to trade um, and particularly if you're producing a new product, if you're a designer and you're thinking about new products, 
and you're really thinking about what is your end of life responsibility. How are you going to manage that? And in in uh, design right now, that uh, from a teaching perspective, what we should be teaching from the very start. And in sort of in my own business practice, uh, when I'm engaging with business, I'm sort of saying, okay, if you can't say where your product's going to end up, then that's an issue that we need to chat about. What kind of business model have, are you intending to create? Or what kind of product are you intending to create if you don't know where it's going to end up? Because ultimately, we really wanted to end back, end up back with that business in a, in a return model, or if not, that it's part of a network of returns, that the business or uh, the designer has really thought about absolutely every element of that product or service. And without that, they will end up with legislative challenges and designing things that just do not fit the market. And so, um, so there's also going to be a demand for transparency in the supply chain and responsibility, as I said, for end of life designed in obsolescence being a thing of the past. Um, so where we uh, understand that we might um, need uh, a, a single-use product might be essential, such as uh, in medical services still, where we're designing you know, products for a range of essential uh, services, we have to then be thinking about, okay, this is a single-use device. What system does it come with? And uh, what is our justification for getting rid of those materials at end of life? So, because you can get caught up in going, all oh, right, okay, well, if I can't find out where it ends up, or if I don't know exactly where it, I can't do it, or I'm really stuck. And again, you know, if you have a good designer in your business, then you have an incredible resource that is trained to problem solve. And so it's really teasing out those problems, getting those business tools out. And because there'll be uh, other challenges are um, the landfill ban. So by 2025, there'll be so many materials um, that are uh, banned from landfill, plastics, textiles. And so how are we going to make sure that we can ensure that they are divested from landfill? What is your, how is your business managing that? How is it managing the materials that it, it's working with? And so the kind of so therefore, in summary of that, businesses will face new challenges uh, of managing the business to business relationships. So again, what are they looking for from their suppliers? What are the suppliers able to offer? And then business to consumer models, the consumer um, will start to, to ask for new models. So they will don't want, we hope that in the future consumers will start to think about, yeah, I don't want to own that. Actually, I can't afford to own that, but I wouldn't mind accessing it a few days a month, or I wouldn't mind uh, accessing that once a, once a, a season. Or, um, yeah, I only, you know, like e-gear or something like that. These kind of rental models have always been there, but they will become uh, more of the norm. So businesses need to uh, think about how are they going to manage the consumer of the future. Some really good answers there again, and just a quick overview of, of the topics that were touched upon there. So Lynn Wilson um, touched upon sort of the mandatory training requirements that are going to be upcoming, as well as the demand from both the supply chain and the consumer. Terry noted again that there's no getting away from this. You know, we're seeing circularity in our everyday lives. So it really is resp uh, responsibility of for businesses to start looking at it. And Beth touched upon responsibility as well, but responsibility from an environmental perspective, which I thought was really interesting. So, so the next question is, what benefits could you see for businesses and or communities that aim to be more circular? And Josie, I think I'll come to yourself first on this one before we, we jump into the answers. Well, all, all businesses should, should be looking at this as, 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 a, as, a, as a really exciting opportunity um, in terms of the benefits. It's about being able to be um, transparent, 
and to 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 tell the story of your um, your business model, um, and and that is, I think, increasingly important. If we look at for a business, for example, like Harris Tweed Hebrides, being able to um, communicate the um, the authenticity of that business, how it supports the local com community, the um, provenance of, of where um, the fabric is made. And I think a lot of that comes back to being able to really celebrate communities and, and thinking about also um, the local communities. In Scotland, we have a really rich heritage of, um, of design that really embraces um, the the region and I think I think that is is a fantastic story in terms of sustainability and circularity I think I think really it's it's an opportunity to be completely um, open and and I think working in that way is 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 really the way forward to be able to communicate effectively and and also to be looking at profits in a way that um, benefits others, whether it's others that you work with in a supply chain or whether it's working with um, within the local community. But I think I think that's that's increasingly important. That kind of more altruistic um, uh, perspective for businesses. Thanks for that, Josie. I think that was a was a really good answer. And I thought one really interesting point there was about really using circularity as a way to differentiate both businesses and the communities that they work within from that. So I really, really appreciate that. So now we'll hear on this topic from Ben Durak and Beth Wilson. So I guess uh, you both kind of touched on the fact that um, consumers are changing, that their, their demands are changing. Um, as, as you say, we've sort of reached this pinnacle now where I think businesses are starting to see that um, consumers are demanding change. So clearly, by by becoming more circular in in real ways, um, allows them to to engage with their consumer with, with their customers better, um, create stronger relationships with their customers. Um, we we live in an age now where we've we've never been more connected. Um, businesses are incredibly well connected to their customers. So. I could, I could definitely see that being a benefit to, to a business. Um, I guess communities as well um, is, is a big one. Um, I think, like, look, there's, there's a growing understanding um, in terms of, I guess, the, the damage that we're causing to our planet. Um, but not, not just the damage that we're causing. I think we've all been aware of, of that for some time, but I think there's a growing awareness now of, I guess, the change that's needed and the things that we can do to affect that change. Um, there's a really good sort of quote that I see kicking about quite a lot, and it's um, essentially, we, we don't need one or two people doing circularity really well. We need lots and lots and lots of people doing circularity badly. <laughs> Because even if we have lots and lots of people doing circularity badly, chances are that's probably enough to turn the tide. I think that a lot of the um, standards people are looking at are where we are at right now. So we're going to get better from here. We're not looking back dating and looking where we're in the challenge starts now. It's what can we do to move forward? What can we do to get better? What are we already doing and celebrate um, and let our customers know that we are already achieving? Um, one of the particular things that you know Harris Beauty Company is really proud of is that we are the support to sustainable rural employment. Um, so all the feed that's woven at Harris Beauty Company and um, at Harris Beauty actually generally is woven by hand in Islanders' homes. So it can be a second job, it can be a full time job. It's sustainable way of living to employ people to work around their own schedules to have an income on an island that maybe doesn't have as many employment opportunities as elsewhere so that's a sustainable development goal that we're really proud of that is mentioned a lot and um, when past future is about 
must be to follow and sell and sell the product. And so that is what we're really hitting well in the target, but there are obviously still areas that we can improve on. Some great answers there again. You know, Beth touched upon the, the celebration and pride that ha Harris uh, Tweed Hebrides take, you know, they're, they're with their circular outlook on that. And, and Ben, you know, mentioned about how consumers are growing awareness of the, the need for change and are demanding that change from the companies they work with. You know, Ben, the quote that I love is, you know, we don't need, you know, one or two people doing circularity very well. We need lots and lots of people doing circularity bad way, badly. And I always, always love that quote. So the next question is, so what support could help you on your way to being more sustainable or circular? And now, Daniel, maybe I'll come to yourself on this topic. Yeah, sure, sure. No, thanks for that. Um, again, I, th I think lots of people have said lots of varied answers in the, the interviews that Josie and I did. Uh, and it was quite interesting, actually. You know, there was lots of, lots of people talking about funds and funding and the fact that Scotland is a fantastic place to be trying to do anything sustainable uh, at the moment, actually. You know, there, there's a huge amount of um, investment out there and opportunities and calls for innovation and thinking differently about how we can be circular and it's fantastic but also you know from another perspective quite a few people and we'll, we'll hear from some people just now talking about this actually um, but in the sense that it's not just about money you know and it's actually about support it's about networks it's about sharing of information and it's about uh, education you know, these are the these are the types of things that lead to really meaningful behaviour change, and and that's what we're really looking for in terms of like propelling a circular economy past you know that point where uh, as Ben as Ben was talking about, there is that quote we hear quite a lot, and it's it's a, it's about you know not just big companies um, or or certain companies doing circularity um, really well. It's about all of us um, trying to do it, and in some cases doing it badly, but just doing it. Um, so yeah, support is, is about you know, infrastructure where people can go and they can gain information about how can I be more circular. And some, sometimes the challenges of circular economies are the fact that they are so huge. They are massive, they're difficult to engage with, they're difficult to understand, they're difficult to see how they work. Uh, and the challenge with that is that you know, the everyday person can find it really difficult to try and be a meaningful part of that. So information, support networks, uh, these sorts of things, these sharing platforms where, where circular economies can become just that little bit more transparent and make it just a little bit easier for us to engage with them. Thanks so much for that, Daniel. So now what we're going to do is hear the answers from Ben Durak, Terry Vogt and Lynn Wilson on this question. So, I mean, our, our vision of Origin has always been really clear. We, we know what it's going to take to set up an Origin hub. So it, it's decentralised manufacturing that takes place essentially in a retail unit. Um, so for that to happen, we need um, an industry leading injection molding machine. We're talking near hundreds of thousands of pounds in terms of kit. Um, but obviously I think that the biggest thing for Origin and we've, we've, we've had some really positive experiences on social is the power of community. Um, so the, the more the word gets out, the harder it becomes for, for us not to get taken seriously. Um, so I think the, the the biggest support we could possibly have is um, I guess more more traction on social because we can use that to demonstrate that Origin is something that the local community cares about. Um, and I guess to set up our first Origin hub, we we need to show that this is something that that not the world cares about, that Aberdeen cares about Aberdeen specifically. Because if we can show that Aberdeen cares about this, we can set up our first hub. <laughs> If we can set up our first hub and show that's a success, then we can start reaching out to other communities around the world and setting up more hubs to begin to have the impact we want to have. It's not necessarily always money. I mean, I think you know, that there has been funding and is funding available for sort of innovative new ways of doing things, and that is one element of moving to a circular economy. But a lot of it is it's much simpler. It's things that we know how to do and we understand how to do. Um, on a sort of community level, I think there should be more support for funding to set up a lot of these types of things like, you know, reuse hubs, repair hubs, you know, 
I think there's a lot of opportunity to gauge the, the community in this um, and support them do that. I think from a sort of business perspective, a lot of it's about understanding and awareness. And that's come out of the studies that we've done with businesses is that although the awareness of the circular economy has gone up, Businesses' confidence in doing anything about it has not changed at all in the last three years. It shows that even though people understand more the concept, they feel no more confident about what they can do about it. And that's partly because um, it might be difficult for them to be, to be able to do something themselves. I mean, I think a lot of this is about collaboration, and I think there needs to be resources and support in, in aiding and assisting those collaborations, the learning, and helping organisations, businesses, you know, businesses with local authorities and within regions to actually work together. And I think there needs to be, I think that's where we would like to see the role of Circular the North East going forward, is being able to facilitate and support those collaborations because nobody's really doing it at, at the moment. Um, and I think that there needs to be, uh, there needs to be more support for individual businesses to understand what it can mean and more support to help collaborations to make, you know, to change things and make things done too differently. I love the idea of a, a, a sort of sustainable business body service, you know, where you have, um, it can be a peer mentor or a business mentor who had been on the journey and maybe fell down, like you say, Josie, you know, they've, they've had those um, challenges and picked themselves up, they're still on their journey, you know, saying I'm a perfect example of sustainable or circular business practice. I'm just a little bit more experienced in the journey than, than another business and I can help them along the way. Or that kind of idea of two businesses who are potentially completely different um, sectors buddying up and saying, let's go on this sustainable journey together. Let's find a space where we can ask all the data questions to each other so that we can go and find out together so that we, uh, and legislation is tough, you know, and, and uh, it's hard trying to work through it and, and understand your obligations and responsibilities. And even when you're working with the different business networks in Scotland and, and organisations that are there to support, you can still walk away and go, God, I don't really get how that, how does that actually relate to my business? When you get back to your, your spreadsheet and you're like, where do I start? No. And so if you have a, like a, a business buddy that's also maybe in, in the same journey, a different sector, and you can somebody you can touch base with and say, Have you, you know, have you had to think about this? What do you think? And to build confidence, uh, because it's about building confidence in business, and um, and that requires a lot of communication and a lot of questioning and not being scared because you're already scared, you're a business, so you're already terrified excited every morning when you wake up and terrified at the same time that what's going to happen today so you don't need any more pressure but you do need to understand what's ahead for you and, and what you need to get on board with and so yeah that idea of a, a mentoring buddying um but a real person because there's so much stuff online and there are so many webinars that you can watch and that is amazing and uh, but equally, that, that sort of actual engagement, that real engagement, is critical to, to building confidence. Some great answers there again. What I really appreciated from that was that you know all of the three answers that we heard from none of them mentioned you know purely financial support needed. It was all about, you know, supporting each other through collaboration, social traction, which I, th I thought was great. So we're going to move on now to what is the final question. So what do you think about greenwashing? How does this affect your business, industry or community? So Josie, I'm interested in, in hearing your perspective on this. Yeah, I mean, greenwashing is very damaging. Um, it's, it's damaging both to the consumer because they are unable to trust the information that they are given by companies. Um, it's also dangerous within the um, companies to companies where the, I think 
where you're not able to to have confidence in your supply chain and knowing where that the, the, those that you're working with have got the same values as, as you have. Um, I think I think we need to really look at greenwashing as a, an issue around consumer education. And I think the more consumers ask and probe questions and understand um, the, 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 the requirements of sustainability and, and responsibility of companies, I think the more they'll begin to really question um, whether those companies' um, um, statistics and um, viewpoints are, are actually real. And, and we're seeing increasingly companies being outed um, on, on their supposed um, green credentials. And, and I think that's, that's, that's absolutely how it should be. And I, I, think, I think there has to be a, a really honest um, discussion between business and consumers and, and that, that in order to build trust. And I think that's incredibly important. Thank you for that, Josie. And just before we move on to the answers, is there anything you want to add to that, Daniel? Thanks, Neil. Yeah, I, I would just, I would really concur. I think, you know, greenwashing, to be honest with you, it's not about blame, I don't think. It's just about education. You know, a great deal about the circular economy and about sustainability and, and environmental impacts, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of it, about, it is about transparency and it's about education and really understanding what these things are. And I think a lot of the time companies, you know, they enter into carbon offsetting approaches because they're trying to do something meaningful in many ways, um, but maybe not understanding um, whether or not that really does cancel out the impacts of maybe some of the other things that they do. So, um, yes, I, I would agree with what a lot of the speakers have said about the fact that it's not about blaming anybody or anything like that, but I think it is definitely about maybe companies being able to uh, have more understanding about maybe the claims um, that are that are associated with certain types of offsetting activity or, or materials that they use. Um, materials are a really difficult one. And I think it's Terry actually talks about this in relation to packaging. You know, plastics within packaging is, is really challenging. You know, bioplastics, um, how compostable are they and what actual processes do you need to engage with in order uh, to break them down properly, et cetera. And all of these variances and all these challenges just make it more and more difficult for uh, businesses and for consumers to, to really feel confident about what it is that, that they're saying or hearing or reading uh, whenever they're engaging with a subject. Thanks so much for that, Daniel. Um, so we'll move on to the answers from the, from the interviewees now. So we'll hear from Terry Boat and Mo Tomney. This greenwashing and lack of clear information, I think, is a real problem. If we look at the circuit economy, it's a real problem in terms of yeah, the claims that products and things are potentially making about those products. But I think part of the problem is not necessarily, you, you can in part maybe blame the producer or the manufacturer, but it's also because we have too little guidance or advice in the classic is packaging where we're in a complete and utter muddle on packaging where you know is it is it compostable but then is it compostable in a in a garden or is it compostable in a in an industrial plant and then if it is compostable in an industrial plant you know, if I put this bag in my food waste will Keenan's actually know that this is a compostable bag or will this actually make them throw that bag out or and then you know there's a real confusion around you know bioplastic and well actually bioplastic doesn't necessarily biodegrade at all it just means it's got some you know biodegradable materials in it but it, there is you know and people I mean I bought some jeans not long ago that said they were sustainable and I, I it's probably my own fault I had in my head that this meant that they were sustainable cotton but it turned out it had they were partly made out of plastic I thought, well, that's all very well, but does that mean that every time I wash them, microplastics are going to come off? And was this a good buy or a bad buy? So I think it's extremely confusing at the moment as a consumer to know whether you're buying the right thing. And I do think there needs to be more, you know, regulation in terms of um, 
trying to assist in, in people having a better understanding of what, what they're purchasing. So there's that aspect. And then there's the greenwashing aspect of the point of view of companies making big claims. Uh, you probably see less of that in the circularity space at the moment than you maybe do in the next zero space, where you know, you've know you got companies claiming to be carbon neutral, but that actually means it's just their office emissions or something, you know what I mean? It, it, so there is also a lot, and a lot of it's because these things can't be simply explained, and, and you know maybe we have to be more open to that, you know, as a society, you know, everything's about sign lights, everything's about, you know, two second explanation, everything's about, you know, grab someone's attention. And I don't really know how you overcome it, but I think it is a, it is a challenge, a big challenge at the moment. I think it's, um, it, you know, it's part of the scenario. And I think it's really difficult, it's difficult for consumers, but it's also difficult for, um, you know, small companies, particularly within the, in the sector, who, who want to be sustainable. If I go back to um, thinking about clients I've worked with who are, who, who, who really think, well, often they think they do understand their value chain. They think they know where everything's coming from. But there is greenwashing in B2B and business to business. But I think that's really common in the industry. So it's very convenient. For um, for a, a you know supplier to have, to to not give out too much information, and it's very easy for them to do that if they're remote. So, so it comes back to this local. You know, lo localization is great because it makes it much easier for everyone to have the, to have those communications and conversations. So greenwashing within the B two B side of, of things is something that I'm Kind of more concerned with i think i mean green i think greenwashing it's 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 yeah it's really challenging it's not that i i don't care about it in the consumer facing bit of the sector because i do care about that but it's i think it, it it's it's about how good you are at telling stories actually and, and you know we're all into storytelling now and brands are telling stories and we've got all you know got social media and all of that um it's yeah i think it's um it, it is that that sort of b2b side of it that really concerns me because a lot of the processes and the, the systems that exist to support brands designers whatever you want to call it in understanding where the stuff is coming from can themselves be, be quite opaque. You almost need a degree sometimes to understand the, the CSR language or to decipher what it means. So that comes to the end of our interview uh, stage. And what we're going to do now is a, a really short Q&A session. I just want to take this uh, opportunity to thank all the, all the speakers who participated in the interviews. I thought they all provided some really fascinating insights into, into all the questions. Fortunately, due to time, we could only share a short snippet of each, but it really awesome, brilliant answers. So thank you for that. So I want to jump into a really short Q&A session, as I mentioned here. So I want to start off with a question, and maybe Josie, I'll come to yourself first on this. So the reason we're hosting this webinar is because there is the complexity around, you know, what is circularity? Now, we've obviously, with COP26 coming up, there's a really big focus on environmental sustainability, both communities and businesses at the moment. If you were a business who's just, you know, come out of the economic strain of the global pandemic, as well as this focus on sustainability, where, where would you start? Yes, that's a very, that's a very good question, isn't it? I mean, where, where do you start? And, and I think... I think a lot of it, as, as we've heard um, from, from our speakers, um, for example, with Lynn, when she talks about the buddy system, I think reaching out to doing some research, looking at businesses that may be in the same sort of sector or, or, or perhaps not even in your sector, but doing things that you, you find are inspiring or interesting. And I think reaching out to them um, would, is a really good way to start because I think ultimately um, 
businesses are really keen to share i think and and to and to i i think it's about building communities there is a lot as as lind also mentioned online support um and, and there, there is i mean that's that's absolutely fantastic so there are a lot of um, resources online to to help businesses begin to to develop this challenge but i think it is about knowing taking small steps it's about taking baby steps it, it it's a very complex issue to uh, immediately try and develop a a business or a company that is totally circular from the beginning and it may just be putting in some initial steps to think about um, who your suppliers are going to be where your materials are going to be you have to definitely build in um, an understanding of what is the end of your products where do you i think that has to be um very well thought out in terms of of, of business planning now um what what it will be the, the the second life will you be thinking about buyback schemes repairing mending um obsolescence is definitely um not it, it is it is a real i think is is really not acceptable anymore and i think if you are making products that only have one life um you need to really look at why and what the materials are are the materials biodegradable are they truly biodegradable um so there are a lot of questions but there is a lot of support and i certainly would recommend that looking at how other businesses doing similar types of products is, is a really good place to start thanks thanks for that Josie. it's a great answer and i think that you know, talking about the wider term sustainability, when I'm, when I'm speaking to businesses, I think it's sometimes forgotten that when we say sustainability, we don't just mean environmental sustainability, but commercial sustainability alongside that. And I often think that's sometimes a little bit ambiguous. Um, Daniel, I don't know if you want to maybe come in with anything there. Uh, yeah, I would totally agree with that, Neil. I, I think that all of the terminology um, can be interpreted entirely differently by different sectors, different industries, different people. Uh, and and they can they can be quite confusing to be perfectly honest. Um, and you know we've all, all heard these these terms being bandied about in the media, and we're, we're bombarded with them now. And it's it, it can be exhausting actually hearing about you know um, the need to be more sustainable, the need to be more circular, and and when it's hard to really understand what those terms really mean because they mean so many different things. That can be quite challenging to be perfectly honest. It really can. But um, yeah, I think, I think sustainability, it, it's about longevity, isn't it? And it, it, it's about being, it's about approaching um, whatever it is that you do, you know, whether from a business perspective, how you arrange your processes um, and how you fulfill what it is that your, your business aims and objectives are. And um, every element of that you can look at to try and understand what things can we change to make a more circular impact. Uh, and, uh, and from a consumer level, just an everyday level, it can be as simple as just asking yourself the question, do I need to throw this away? Can somebody else use it? Um, can I repair it? Uh, things like that. And um, just habits, small habits. And, and we, all, we often talk about in products and we always talk about behavior change. Um, User-centered design is basically about behavior and experience. And, you know, being able to... to to, to ask yourself those questions leads to small impacts in your behavior, et cetera. And, and that's the type of circularity um, that I think is going to be much more meaningful and more impactful over the long, long course of this, to be honest. Thanks so much, Daniel. So the ne next question I really want to pose to you both is one of, the, one of the most commonly used terms through this whole webinar by all the speakers and yourselves when, when I brought to you is the topic of transparency. And I think I'm really interested hear from you both how, how we can actually get there. I know I know that a lot of different sectors are you know talking about the long term goals of maybe having a standardized approach. Is is that the way we get to a standardized approach of waste recording or I mean to interest yourself. Maybe Daniel I'll start with yourself this time. 
Well, I get, again, I think, you know, there's great things happening in Scotland, um, in the UK wide, definitely. But in Scotland, you know, there's the deposit return scheme, which is, um, which is rolling out quite soon. And that not only allows people to just um, have a really visible way to bring back plastic packaging to a receptacle or to a place where they not only um, are getting something back for that, but they know that when they deposit that in there, it's being controlled uh, and it's being sent off uh, and it's being disposed of in as, as circular a manner as is possible at this time. Uh, and within that, there's a, lo there's a lot more regulation, a lot more um, regulation for manufacturers that is coming into play in terms of how they use material, uh, how they use recycle it, uh, and, and the quality of, of the packaging that, that we engage with on, on a daily basis. But I think it's a very, very challenging thing to suggest that, that you know, there could be one standardised practice that could be applied to, to, to all industries, etc. And I think it's, it's one of the most challenging things about circularity and sustainability is that it's a, it's, it's a, it's a humongous area. You know, it's absolutely massive. And it links to every element we could possibly <laughs> think of, really, uh, and and that and that's the biggest biggest challenge with it, really. I think. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Um, Josie, yourself, anything you had there? Yeah, I mean, I, I I totally agree with everything Daniel said. I think also just to bring in this it, the importance of transparency. We're seeing. I think particularly within Scotland with localization, I think, of um, building relationships with local suppliers, working um, with communities, we've seen examples of that with the Harris Tweed Hebrides. A lot of the companies I've worked with have really celebrated looking at Made in Scotland um, as a brand, and that is about ensuring that everything um, materials are, are, um, are, are supplied locally and supporting businesses locally is, is, is a really important part of that as well. And again, that kind of story, building that kind of narrative and story. So I do think Scotland, in terms of its sort of transparency credentials, has is, is very strong. Um, I think international globalization has been a problem um, because things are, are hidden and, and obviously they have big big um, costs in terms of um, in the environment, in terms of air miles. So I think localization is a really important aspect of how we move forward with, with, with this whole circular agenda. That's right. I think that's it's a really good point. Um, so just just the final thing I have to touch upon is is really so throughout all this and to get circularity, I think one of the main things was talked about was collaboration. You know that really links to the transparency aspects. But one thing that you see in a lot of different industries is maybe throughout the supply chain, there's competitors working. But how do we incentivize or convince these companies to collaborate with each other? And um, Josie, maybe come to yourself first this time. Yeah, I, th I think it's very interesting when you talk about that. I mean, I immediately think of a project, a, a KTP I did with Montrose for Open Sale, um, because they wanted to look at new materials and, and they worked um, with with a local Tayside company to develop new, new, new to, to use their, their, their kind of waxed fabrics. And it was about collaboration because they then were able to show some of their new prototype um, uh, products as part of that um, fabric suppliers um, uh, European trade show and and so there was a and immediately there's a kind of in, in there's an interdependence but also um, I think a reward for both businesses in in working together because they both have unique stories to tell, but by bringing them together, that story becomes even stronger. Um, and, and I think I think those sort of models of collaboration and are really are really vital for the way businesses respond and, and, and work within this area. 
Thanks for that. And I think it's a great example of sort of the benefits to collaboration, you know, from the example that you gave. And um, Daniel, is there anything that you want to maybe input there on collaboration and, and why why companies would want to collaborate more? I, I guess I would just say maybe that um, I think companies are finding uh, a great deal of strength by associating themselves with other companies that they think, you know, might fit uh a similar kind of sustainable model uh, as themselves. And uh, probably a good example of that is, as you, as you, you may be aware, uh, as a co-founder of Origin, the whole point of Origin is about transparency. It's about, as Ben said, circularity that you can see. And the amount of companies that that, that, that particular startup has engaged with just simply by association, you know, where their waste can be turned into something really meaningful is a benefit for them. In, in terms of association and, and collaboration. And it's, an, it's a benefit for, for Origin as well in terms of um, association and collaboration. So I think partnering and networking is, is the way to actually grow strength um, for, for companies. So I think it's a no brainer. Collaboration is absolute, as, as much as transparency and education is really important in this space, collaboration and working together is actually just as important. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Daniel. And so I think on that, uh, the final point I would just make is that this has really sort of made clarified a lot of questions I had about what circularity meant. So I hope it can be as useful to others. So I, I just, you know, before I close out the webinar, thank you both so much, Josie and Daniel, for, for your participation in this. And also to thank again the, all the speakers and the interviewers um, that, that participated in the webinar as well. And um, so just, yeah, th thanks so much. And Hopefully, hopefully we we'll continue this circularity uh, push.